Okay, good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to our weekly uh, online class. We've been studying what we believe about the return of Christ. We've already had uh, what I call a 13A lesson, which was two parts, and it was uh, talking about the return of Christ from the perspective of the promise as his return and, and everything associated with what the Bible said about the promise and, and, and the return of Christ and, and things associated with the resurrection at that return. This, this uh, week we're working on the second lesson of the same subject, what we believe about the return of Christ, but this is having to do more with the um, aspects of his return that are in power and righteousness and glory and, and uh, you know, just the, the things that represent everything that will be accomplished during that time. It, we're going to be looking at the return of Christ in glory, the, return, the reign of Christ in power, and we're also going to be looking at the uh, ruling at the great white throne judgment. And we started last week talking about the return uh, of Christ in glory, but um, we, we got onto a subject of Daniel's prophecy in the ninth chapter of the book of Daniel, and it was, uh, it was specific, specifically referring to the prophecy regarding 70 weeks. And um, it was necessary to set that stage because really, um, if you don't understand the 70 week prophecy, or at least get your head around some of it, it's really kind of hard to understand the magnitude of the tribulation period, and then also what it means for Christ's return in glory. So the, the primary topic has been the return of Christ in glory, which is our first point, but we've been studying the 70 weeks of Daniel to set the stage for that. And so we're gonna finish that uh, 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy study this morning. And, and that will put us hopefully in a position to uh, look at the subject of the return of Christ in glory more effectively. Before we do that, though, I'd like us to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And again, continue to pray for our nation, continue to pray for our leadership. Uh, prayer for our leadership is needed now more than any other time. It just seems to be getting uh, worse and worse in some cases, and there's a lot of pushing and pulling. And, um, you know, I think... Uh, we just need them to, to be thinking about the people, what's best for the nation, and hopefully God's leadership um, in, in everything that they do. So let's pray for, let's pray for that. Let's pray for uh, those that are still dealing with the virus, those who are working in um, difficult situations with regards to it for our supply chains and the needs of the nation. Um, and, and also pray for this church and our ministry, pray for this lesson, pray for uh, these lessons and, and sermons as they go out and devotionals. And, and to see if we can uh, just uh, pray to God to bring uh, His Spirit with regards to these things upon every person's heart and life. Um, I'll go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the lesson. Loving Holy Father, we give you thanks for the blessing of this day that you've made, for giving us the life that you've provided us, for showing your mercy and your grace upon us, for allowing us this opportunity, Lord, not only to take a breath, but to, to live in this life uh, in the time that you've allotted. And I, I give you praise today for your son and his sacrifice and for all that Christ has done for us and the grace of God that's been poured out upon the people of this world because of what Jesus did for our sakes. I give you praise for your faithfulness, even when we're not faithful. I give you praise for um, guiding and directing, even when we make poor choices and we, we put ourselves in difficult spots at times. And so, Lord, I ask today that you'll bless us as we study this lesson. I pray that you'll give me teaching grace. I pray that your spirit will visit this lesson, take control of it, and that you might uh, go with your word and spirit out to those that, that hear it and take it in. I pray, Father, that it will be simple and easy to understand and that you'll bring the understanding to the heart of the hearer. I ask, Father, that you'll bless this nation and its leadership. I pray that you'll bless our workers, our supply chain personnel, I pray, Father, that you be with those that are sick and afflicted, not only with the virus, but those that have other needs that the virus has impacted. I pray you'll give wisdom unto the governors and the cities, Lord, to, to make wise decisions and consider all those. I pray for those families that are suffering tonight, not only with the virus, but with the physical needs. I pray, Father, that you will help out, that you'll open up doors, and I ask that you'll just um, bring about your will in all of this as well. I pray for the salvation of lost souls this morning. I pray for the changing of lives to be aligned more to your will and uh, after the pattern of Jesus Christ. Please forgive us of our sins. Please help us to forgive those who trespass us. 
Give us a warm, loving heart and let the love of Jesus be seen in the things we say and do. And Father, I ask these favors and blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, this week we're going to be focused on two primary aspects. And it's the ones that we, we didn't have time to get in last week. The first one is the fulfillment of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And then also the final week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. So we're going to start with the first one there, the the fulfillment of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. So the angel Gabriel, and and, and before I get into this, I I want to say, if you want to go to Daniel chapter 9 in your Bible and uh, have uh, verses 21 through 27 there in front of you, as we um, reflect back on some of those verses, because I'm not going to reread them, but as we reflect back on some of those verses, you can, you'll can have it right there and you'll be able to look at it. And if you want to read forward and backward in the verses, you know, just to get some more of the context. And remember, I would encourage you to do that. But um, G- Gabriel said the prophetic clock would start at the time uh, that a decree was issued to rebuild Jerusalem. From, that, from the date of that decree to the time of Messiah would be 843 years. And we had gotten that number last week by showing a seven-week uh, period, seven weeks of seven years, uh, which would make 49 years, and then 62 weeks of seven years. That, those two combined would be 483 years, and that would bring us up to the time that Messiah would come on the scene. We determined last week that it was talking about seven weeks of years and not seven weeks of days because seven weeks of days doesn't really fit with the biblical numerology and it doesn't fit with the history in years. And so uh, it, it became obvious that the, the prophecy had to do with seven weeks of year or 70 weeks of years because now that we see the time frame of when things started to when the Messiah was cut off to the age of grace, we see uh, that it fit that that time frame that was prophesied there. And I think it's also phenomenal to note, and I say the word phenomenal a lot because that's just the way I feel about the Bible. Whenever it, it speaks to me, it's always something marvelous and phenomenal. It's that um, this was prophesied and said so long ago that even when Jesus was here and the things that he said and the things that he said that's been bore out in history, uh, you know, a lot of people struggle with faith and belief. If you just looked into the Bible and if you actually studied it, it would help your unbelief. It would help the questions that you have, the problems that plague the, the spirit of the person. And so this is one of those things that every time I look at it and I'm, I'm teaching on the subject, in my mind, I'm going, man, this is just really, it's just an awesome thing. And, and, it, and it reveals itself to me that way and it makes my heart yeah, happy. Um, we know from the history that the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem was given by King Artaxerxes of Persia approximately uh, 455 B.C. And we can read about that in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. But I'm a, and, and there's, verses 1 through 8 give a history of what led up to the point where the king actually um, decrees Nehemiah to go back. Um, it, and, and it's really actually kind of a touching story. It shows this relationship that this, this young man had with regards to his king. And this king was a very powerful king. And it shows this relationship that he had. And it was in a very endearing one. But see, God was moving in the heart of this powerful, rich king to bring about his will. And, um, and he was going to bless through this king. Uh, to, to allow his people to go back home and rebuild. And so we're just going to take a snippet of it uh, so that you can see that we're just trying to validate this point that there was a decree given by the king to go back and to restore. And as I said, he actually funded and, and, and large protected the project. But it says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it says this, Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace and uh, appertain to the house, which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I will enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. And so there you see the decree for not only for him to get the freedom to go. And this is a, a king that literally, you know, if he had a problem with you, you, you 
you got dead in a lot of cases. And so it, it, he was a very powerful man, a, a man of war um, and, and accomplished, yet here touched by this relationship with young Nehemiah and, and actually to the point where he saw him burdened about the condition of his homeland, about the condition of his people, about the condition of, of, of their city and things along that line, was touched by it. And God using him to, to, to allow this to take place. But this is part of that prophecy. See, and that's the thing that's important about prophecy is that when you're talking about it, where you'd think that would never happen in the antles of history, yet with God all things are possible. He can move kings and great powerful ones. Here in the time that God decided, he brought a man into the presence of this king and it was one situation where they developed a relationship, the servant with his master, which... You know, a lot of it speaks to a lot of things in our in our life. Our our servitude to our master and 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 the kind of right spirit. If you look at the spirit that um, that Nehemiah had, I'm, now I'm chasing rabbits now. That that's okay. If you look at the spirit Nehemiah had, it really kind of typifies the spirit we should have in service and and what we should have as workers, what we should have as as family members, husbands, wives, fathers, uh, children. Those kind of uh, that kind of spirit of right service. But nevertheless, God moving in this situation to bring about so that his prophecy, what he revealed to the angel Gabriel could be fulfilled. And he moved to accomplish that. Yet, these people were making their decisions. Yet, God was still able to move and, and bring about his will in the, in the midst of it. And that is always a common core thought to about uh, uh, of faith. In other words, that's one of those things where we always keep in, in the common thought of all of the things we study in God's word is that with God, all things are possible. We can have free will and choice, and yet God can still, being sovereign, do what he's going to do in the timeline of, of history. So the first 49 years, seven sevens, were covers, uh, covers the time that it took to rebuild Jerusalem with the streets and the trenches, but in times of trouble, according to Daniel 9.25, that prophecy there. Daniel 9.25, here it is. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, and then three score and two weeks, the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So the rebuilding and the, the rebuilding and all its challenges are chronicled in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And it's really uh, something I think for the Bible student, if you go and study, uh, there's a lot of just beautiful uh, messages in there. It, it really to me speaks, uh, those two books to me speak a lot about um, the challenges we face in life when we're striving for the Lord. We, we understand when we see that that there's, there's going to be challenges, that we're having challenges right now as, as people of faith. But we, we see when we study Ezra and Nehemiah that God was, God's grace was sufficient. God's, God's uh, got the power and ability to help us overcome the challenges that we face in life and the difficulties that we have. It's a really uh, a, a powerful study to get involved in because if you're struggling in life or you're, or you're wanting to just do more, or you're, you're doing more and you're, you're meeting certain challenges along the way and sometimes those are frustrating, you can see that these people, they often uh, uh, relied on God and, and the provisions, the things that they did so that God might bring them through their difficulties to accomplish the goals that he had for them to, to accomplish. And so it's very uh, encouraging and, and thought-provoking. Going on, using the Jewish customs of 360 days a year, 483 years after 45, 445 BC places us around AD 30, which would coincide with Jesus's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Um, and the, the scriptural reference there is Matthew 21, 1 through 9, which we're going to read some of, but not all of. But um, when, you, when you add 445 and 30, you get a different number than 483. But that's because you're really talking about a couple things. So I want to clarify this because I was looking into it. You're talking about, the, first of all, you, the Jewish custom of 365 days a year. So you're knocking off five days a year. That's going to equivalent, uh, equate to uh, close to six or seven years. But also, you're talking circa or around the time frame. The date which actually took place around 
445 BC. It, it, it's in that ballpark. And so where, wherever that start is, if it was this month or that month, it's consistently, you're right in that time frame when Jesus rides into. And so there's been a lot of, uh, you, I, in fact, I was looking at all the different uh, perspectives and calculations that, that various uh, Bible students with zeal have gotten into, and they've layered it all out. And they said, well, if this was this, and this was this, and, and how they view it, and th then they tie it to even completely other things. And it, it was an interesting read to read that over the week, but uh, most conclude approximately, the decree was approximately right around the time of 445, could have been 446 or jump six months before 445 uh, BC, but nevertheless, the time frame w where it started puts us right with, uh, based on the 360-day calendar, put us right at the, at the, the time when Jesus was going to ride into Jerusalem before he was crucified. And, and it fits. And, and so from the time frame, it, it's a very powerful statement that God has made with regards to everything that he has accomplished. It also shows us that, that, you know, where we have a tendency to question God and we say, hey, you know, God this, why, why, why this? Why? God's got a plan. And that doesn't mean that um, in the midst of his plan that he's going to ignore our, our needs, our desires, our wills. Our, you know, if we're having a faith issue and we're struggling with having faith in God, even though he's on a certain plan, he's still going to meet our need. And, and he has done that. He's been a God that reveals himself and a God that, that, uh, that cares and shows his love and care and the way he provides and takes care of us. I mean, take a breath. That's the grace of God. And, and, and that's been going on for at least 51 years of my life. So um, anyways, I, I, I wanted to bring this, this tally up so that we could at least understand it. But now we're going to read the parts of Matthew that pertain to the fulfillment, fulfillment of this prophecy with regards to Messiah writing in on in Jerusalem. It says in Matthew um, 21, verse 1b, it means I'm not reading the whole verse, all the way up to verse 4, it says this, Then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. And so there's a reference to uh, Jesus going, his entry going into the prophesied that he would go in uh, on an ass, and, um, and, and so it's being fulfilled here. The thing that's interesting about biblical scriptures, and, and a lot of times I'm going to take another sidestep. I know we're studying Daniel 70 weeks, but there's always things that uh, I want to add to it because I'm that way as a teacher. Um, it always amazes to me how many people that don't believe in the Bible or are atheistic in their mindset. The first thing a lot of them tell you is, I've read the Bible. <laughs> you know, that's great, but the Bible's really meant to be studied. And I think a lot of people, if you're just reading things, you're going to miss a lot. Uh, it takes a large amount of time for a pastor to prepare a message because it takes a lot of study. It takes a lot of time to prepare a lesson because it takes a lot of time to study. Sometimes you can study for hours and hours and hours to get something that's 30 minutes worth of time. Or a devotional that you might see from Ronnie uh, in the services tomorrow. It's going to be something he's going to spend hours putting together for five to seven minutes because there's a study and effort that goes into making sure that what is said is accurate and not just something. I mean, you can, a lot of things can be taken completely out of context. There's rules for interpretation and understanding literature, and those rules apply to this literature as well because it is a form of literature, but it's also important that we understand. You can read the Bible, but until you start studying it and, and, and looking into it, then that's when things start to, to work for you. So um, that's what we're doing here. We're, this whole series of lessons is a, is a point of doing just that, getting in and understanding why we believe what we believe. What, what are we going to tell people about the return of Jesus Christ? Well, this is why. I'm giving you these verses so that you can look at them and say, okay, and, and then take them from there and begin to build your study base on it. Here's an... Uh, um, a passage of scripture that's being that's being revealed to us where a prophecy is being fulfilled. Now, the prophecy in Daniel 9 specifies that after the completion of the 483 years, the anointed one would be cut off. 
Here's a scene where we are at this time frame, and Jesus is seen riding into Jerusalem on a, on a donkey just prior to his crucifixion. So the time frame fits, and these are the things that kind of validate themselves in the Bible. The Bible oftentimes is its own commentary, oftentimes is its own, um, it gives its own revealing of its own prophecies. And so uh, this is one such point. This uh, was fulfilled when Jesus was crucified. And um, I think it's important to note some of the other things in Daniel's prophecy that was fulfilled as well. In Daniel 9, I actually had printed out a part of my PowerPoint, and I had it so I wouldn't have to go look it up. And I was just sitting here teaching <laughs> when I realized it's like, oh, yeah, you forgot that one. So that, that one's at home still. But at 9, um, okay, it's going to be in verse... Give me a second. Okay, let's look at 25. No, verse 26. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be 70 weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall and even in troublesome times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself and the people or the prince that shall be, the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and to the end of war desolations are determined. Um, so, actually, I want to, and that's not the part I want to. I just did all that, and I want to go back to verse twenty-four. So that was a that was a bonus. So now you're refreshed. Everyone's good. I'm going to go back to 24. Seventy weeks are determined against thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity. That's the verse I wanted. Because right here where it says, we have on our PowerPoint, this, uh, this will be fulfilled when Jesus has come. Well, look at some of the things that Jesus fulfilled. There was at least three of them. Well, there's going to be a lot more. But okay, so I say that. Let me just take a step back. Because I realize this is going out online. And I know when it goes online and I say something like that, someone's watching, they're going to say, now, now wait a minute, not exactly accurate. Jesus has, had, had, hadn't come, but in, in, in the antles of eternity, in God's viewpoint of it, as, as if he already did. It was a done deal, really. That's why um, the uh, Old Testament saints who uh, um, Hebrews chapter 11 says were saved by faith. Faith was is what saved those individuals, even though Christ hadn't come, because in God's eyes, it is, 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 is as, as if he already had. So what I'm saying to you now, these, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, these things were fulfilled then, but there, everything else is really fulfilled in the sense that it's going to be no matter what. And so I don't want people to get me contextually sideways when they watch this. I'm just trying to point out here in verse 24, this that Jesus did on the cross for our sakes, he finished transgression, made an end of sins, and he made reconciliation for iniquity. Um, he really did bring in everlasting righteousness, and, and there's still some things that need to be done. Because my righteousness with regards to my salvation is everlasting in Jesus Christ. So when we look at this scene where we have these dates that have come up from the time when they were sent out to um, build to the time when Jesus came in and, and right before he was cut off and, the, and that period of years being filled, 483 of them, uh, according to the uh, calculations made by the Jewish calendar, we have a fulfillment of a large portion of this, but there was still some stuff that needed to be done. Um, Daniel 9.26 continues with the prediction that after Messiah was killed or put to death, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, this was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. And really, um, it was also uh, something Christ had prophesied with regards to the time of the Gentiles, which we've talked about in previous lessons. And we've, we've identified that this time of the Gentiles, it would be a time when they would have power and they would have uh, the ability to really, you know, control a lot of the affairs of the things of the earth. But then God would also use those same Gentile people to carry his, world, his word into the world. 
And so not only was it the times of the Gentiles for their control and power, but it was also the times of the Gentiles with regards to them tearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message that Jesus had died on the cross for the sins of the world and that through him people could be forgiven of their sin. That message would go out by them same people and it would spread throughout the earth and it continues to today. But I want to look at this. Verse 26 of Daniel's prophecy continues the prediction that was fulfilled in AD 70 when Rome destroyed uh, Jerusalem, essentially. And the ruler who would come is a reference to a future coming Antichrist, who, many suggest, will have some connection with Rome since it was the Romans who destroyed Jerusalem. So let's talk about that for a second. The ruler who would come in actuality was the ruler who came in AD 70 and destroyed Jerusalem. But he, that man, that leader at that time, was a type. And, and, and in, in his actions here on the earth in AD 70, we see a small picture of a greater. And so a lot of times in the Bible, you find these types or pictures. You know, I could give you a list of them that just come right up to the top of my head. But, but honestly, this type of, of what you see in this ruler is a type of, of character or uh, some would say even tyrant or uh, self-elevated or, uh, you know, whatever motivated him to do the things he did in the way that he did him, even sealing the gates of the city. You know, it was just really a, a devastating thing for the people of Israel. But um, he was a type of ruler that represent uh, or a representative and type of what would be to come. And that one that would come, we refer to as the Antichrist during the tribulation period, that one to come is, is greater, meaning um, more efficient at those same skills, more uh, evil in the way that he approaches things and the things that he will do. And some say that because it was Rome that destroyed Jerusalem, that, there, that, that, suggests, that that suggests a tie between this Antichrist and Rome. Now, that's, history will bear that out either way, but I'm just telling you what, what many believe and hold. The final week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy of the, 70, uh, of the seven, 77s, 69 have been fulfilled in history. This leaves one more seven yet to be fulfilled. Most scholars believe that we are in now living in a huge gap between the 69th and 70th week. We've touched on this, and there's referred to as a lot of things, the church age. And the reason it's called the church age is because Jesus Christ, during his personal ministry, started the church. And that church has prospered throughout time and has become uh, the vessel or the, um, the message-bearing body of Jesus Christ. And, it, it, and even though some, in, in our his, some of our historians would say that there was periods of time when there was no church, that's not true because Jesus Christ himself said, I'll be with you always even until the end of the age. The, it also says in the word of God that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So while they may not have seen a, a physical building, the, the church isn't the building. The church is the people, and there's been a church. And so um, the church age is an age that has prospered by the grace of God to be a, 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 an age where the Spirit of God was in the earth and the church and, and, and moving in the church and, and uh, lives were being changed and thriving. But then again, there was a lot of persecution as a result of the message because there was a lot of people that didn't want the message. It was also called, this, this gap is also called the age of grace. And it's called the age of grace because it's an expression uh, of the grace of God that we find in Jesus Christ. Um, I wanted to give you an example of this. You know, we, I say grace, but really it's, it's the age of God glorifying the Son. And, and, uh, and that's how I like to look at it. I'll give you an example of this. It's in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 3, verse 12. And um, Peter had, had, uh, had come down to this area. He had done some miracles, and, um, and the people reacted to it. And it says in verse 12, it says, And Peter saw it and answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look you so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son, Jesus. And so he was giving credit to the healing of the man that, that, that 
was lame, that was healed and could walk, to just something that was obvious to him. God the Father glorifying the Son. And so the age of grace is, is really a glorification, a time of glorifying Jesus Christ. To us, it's been uh, 2,000 years, but it's really not a long period of time. Not to say that God wasn't glorifying his Son um, you know, in, in other uh, dispensations of time, because I think you can find evidence of that throughout the Word. I mean, he was held up. As, as the Messiah and, uh, by the Old Testament saints, one who would come for their sake. So he's being glorified from that perspective. But he has come. He has died on the cross. He had paid the price for sin. He gave claim victory over death in the grave. Sets currently on the right hand of the Father, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, um, having put, put uh, away all sin in himself and having completed the thing and set down, showing that he was complete. And, and so God's glorified his son in the world. He's glorified his son in the lives of men. We're beneficiaries of that. We're people who, who get to, we live in a good time. We, we, we get to enjoy the, the message of God that we have and everything in it and, 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 uh, and live in the grace of God where God is allowing us to serve and worship and praise him for what Jesus has done for our sakes. And, and what a great gift it is. It's called the age of the Gentiles for the reasons we've already said, and I won't go back into that and recap that. The prophetic clock has been paused, as it were, and I believe the Bible teaches that this is due to the grace of God so that he might glorify his son as a result of his sacrifice for sin. God's glorifying his son and the saving power of his shed blood is an extension of, the grace to, of God's grace to humanity, an extension of his love for his son and for, his, and for mankind. This age of grace, this church age, this age of the Gentiles, I think is a, an expression. And I think the two of the three names sum it up better. The age of grace and the, uh, the church age are a great expression of how much God loves his son and how much he loves mankind, that he's extended this time frame for our benefit. And there's something to be said about that. And you know what? He's God. So whatever time works for him, <laughs> you know, is good for me. The final seven of Daniel's prophecy is what we usually call the tribulation period. Daniel's prophecy reveals some of the actions of the Antichrist as well. He says the Antichrist, the ruler who will come, um, he says he will confirm the covenant with many for one seven. However, in the middle of the seven, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation in the temple. Jesus warned of this event in Matthew 24, 25. So here's another instance where Daniel prophesied hundreds of years early, but Christ warns of, of this event and, 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 and talks about it when he's teaching on the earth. And this is the passage of scripture. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. So he makes a reference to that. He says, uh, it also goes on to say, Whosoever readeth, let him understand. So the, the point of emphasis there on understanding the teaching that Jesus was revealing, the, the, the understanding the teaching that was revealed by that which was spoken to, uh, to Daniel by the angel Gabriel, to understand that, that it's important to get it. See, and this goes back to what I'm saying about reading versus teaching, because studying is getting into it. And, getting, and breaking it down, trying to research everything that God's Word has on the topic, becoming exhaustive on the subject. And that's what Jesus is, is, is uh, admonishing them to do. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Let him, let him not be passive about what's being spoken, because something big this way comes. You know, there's going to be a problem. And he's saying, when, when, that for, when you see that abomination spoken by the Daniel prophet, stand in the holy place. It's not going to be good. After the Antichrist breaks the covenant with Israel, a time of great tribulation brings or, or begins. Matthew 24, verse 21. So later on in that same chapter, Jesus taught this. He says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor, no, nor ever shall be. So now he's, got, he's given them a, a, a viewpoint of what that seven-year period of time is going to look like. When you see the, the first part, a lot of biblical um, uh, historians have it as 
or scholars have it as uh, more of a time of peace, a uh, peaceful time, although there's a lot of abomination going on. It's not necessarily as troubled. Now, that's a matter of perspective. I think some people find it very troubling, but others will not see it so bad. But when he, when he breaks his covenant in the middle of that seven-year period, what you see then is what they call tribulation the great, a great uh, deal of trouble that breaks out on the earth as a result. And, uh, and, and I'm not going to go into the tribulation. Believe me, there's people that have dedicated their whole life to studying about the tribulation. They've gone into the book of Revelations. They've gone into the prophetic writings of Daniel. They've looked at everything that Jesus spoke about, what's been recorded in, in uh, some of the gospel, uh, some of the um, books of the Bible in the New Testament. And they've just been spent a lot of time cutting their teeth on that. That's a lot of years worth of effort. And we don't have time to do that. But I encourage you. To, uh, to take that up. It's an interesting and very powerful subject. Daniel also predicts that the Antichrist will face judgment. And it says in uh, Daniel 9.27, it says he, he only rules until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So there's something that's being said here, a lot of things that's being said here. One this, this individual, this Antichrist, that's going to be present and, and on the scene during this seven-year period of time known as the tribulation period, he's only going to rule until the, the end that is decreed is poured out upon him. And, and it says something about that. With all the power that's in the world, it doesn't matter how powerful you think the, the leadership in this world is or the nations of this world are. Just remember that little world in the hand of God. It's nothing compared to him. The Antichrist, uh, the devil, and all his angels, they, they do not have ultimate power. God's already decreed that at, at, at a time I say, it's done. This is what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And so he, there's, he'll only go so far. He'll only allow evil to prevail for so long. And, the, and then the judgment the Antichrist will face has already been planned out. So he's already essentially seen it. He knows how it's going to go down, and he's already decreed that that is exactly how it's going to go down. And it goes to show us a, a thing, a, a lot of things. We don't fool God. We don't fool him. He sees it all. He knows everything about our heart, our mind, our thinking. We think we can kind of tuck away over here or hide out over here. He, we see him. And, and, but then on the other side of the coin, we don't fool God. So there's two aspects to that. You could look at it like, oh, I'm doing something bad and I'm hiding. Or you could look at it that my heart is really right and he sees everything about that. So there's a positive aspect to that. But there can be a negative aspect to it as well. And if you're outside of the will of God, there can be a negative one. If you've rejected God's will or his offering, that, there could be a negative one. I just want to point that out. But if you're one of those that's just striving, there's a very positive aspect to what's being said here as well. In closing, the prophecy of the 70 weeks is complex and amazingly detailed, and much has been written about it. Of course, there are various interpretations, but what we have presented here is dispensational premillennial view. Dispensation has having to do with a, a, a time frame, a, a period of time, and, and, and so we're, we're looking at it from the time period with regard to the premillennial view of, of uh, this fulfillment of this prophecy. So we see that um, when that 70th week, whenever God starts the clock again on that, when he says, okay, we're closing out now, we're going to start the clock on that. And then seven years later, it's going to come to an end. We see that time frame as being pre-millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And so... One thing is certain, God has a timetable, and he is keeping things on schedule. He knows the end from the beginning, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10, and we should always be looking for the triumphant return of our Lord, Revelations 22, 7. And I have these verses here I want to share. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 says this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Now, mic drop on that one. That's, that's the reality. And you know, men can deny that all they want. But I'm going to read that one more time. 
and I'm gonna, I just want you to focus on it. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. There is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring, and here's the proof he gives, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Notice uh, declaring the end from the beginning, so he knows the end already, and revealing from times way, way back things that hadn't even come to pass yet. That's what we've been looking at, and that's what he's been declaring with things like Daniel's 70-week prophecy. Revelations 22, 7 says, Behold, though I come quickly, blessed is he that keep the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Behold, I come quickly. So this concludes really Daniel's 70-week prophecy. We see it as this time of seven years that was from the time the issue was decreed to go out and build the city and the walls. So that seven years, uh, seven weeks was 49 years. And then the other, uh, everything from that point to Jesus for a total being um, 483 years. Then we enter the age of grace, which we're in right now, or the church age. And at some point, that last seven-year period is going to um, uh, start up again. And it's going to conclude with the sealing up of the prophecy and the anointing of the Most High, and then the millennial reign of Christ. And so that's kind of how it, it, it appears. Now, when we, that brings us, and this is, uh, I'll leave with these last few thoughts. Um, that brings us back to where we started at the beginning last week. So the very first thing I, I started to cover last week was this thought. As we consider the topic of the return of Christ in glory, we must dive into the subject of the tribulation period. Now we've done that. We've located it on the map. It's, it's that last seven-year period following this time that we're in right now. And when that starts up, we don't know. Um, but it's that time period. And so we have outlined Daniel's prophecy concerning God's 70 weeks to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring ever, in everlasting righteousness, which I think have all been done essentially through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but also to seal up the vision of pro and prophecy, which yet needs to be fulfilled, and to anoint the most high or most holy. That should be capitalized. Um, and I would say, in, a, in, in the literal sense, the anointing of the most holy is, is a done deal. But in the, in the sense of, this, as far as this earth concerned, and the position that they'll have with regards to every tongue confessing and every knee bowing, that's going to happen. Um, the final seven years are fulfillment of that prophecy. That time is also known as a tribulation period. That time is coming. And next week, we'll get into Christ's triumphant return, not as the lamb that was slain, but as a roaring lion of wrath and judgment. And so that concludes this lesson this morning. I know I got a little sideways in there with some things and probably got a little confusing when I was going to look for scriptures. But hey, that's just the reality of being a teacher. You know, it's not always a perfect, uh, it's not always a perfect thing we do. But uh, just bear with me and hopefully this stuff makes sense to you. And then as you go back through it, if you if you have the liberty to do that or the desire that um, it will reach you and it'll start to make more and more sense. That was the heaviest part of this series of lessons on this subject, I believe. I think the rest will get a whole lot easier. Um, but then you know what? Look, when we're studying, it's never, uh, it's never, or it's, it's, sometimes it's not easy. It's sometimes subjects are difficult, but if you're gonna spend the time and you're gonna get in and you're gonna dig down deep and you're gonna work through the scriptures, you're going to receive the harvest of that. You know, the, you can you can go shallow, and you can just dig a couple layers, and that's what you're going to get. But those that put in the effort and try to understand and do the studies, and you may study this out, you may not necessarily agree with everything that I put out here. Fine, at least you're studying, at least you're getting into it, at least you're striving. That is really the goal, and be praying to God that He'll bless you in the effort to do that, and your efforts to do that, that He'll open your eyes to it and bring you to a place ultimately closer to him. That's my prayer for you today. We'll close in a word of prayer. Gracious Holy Father, I come before you, Lord, thankful for this time we've had to be able to spend in this lesson. I pray that it was a blessing, Lord, um, uh, to those that hear it or will hear it. I pray that it brings you honor and glory. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to move in my life to understand more of your word, to be able to uh, convey it to others in a way that's easy to understand. 
And Father, help my, in, my uh, inabilities. Please help my, um, my shortcomings. And I pray that you might just uh, continue to use my life. I ask, Father, you forgive me of my sins and, and that you just might bless our church. I pray, Father, that you'll bless the hearers of this lesson this morning. I pray that you'll bless those that, um, that are striving to get to know you and try striving to come closer together to you in life. I ask that you'll just bless those lives um, and just lift them up and edify them. I pray, Father, that you'll reveal yourself to all of us in, in, in a way that you know how, in a special way. Help our faith to grow and mature and increase. Please forgive us for all of our shortcomings and trespasses towards you and others, and bless us, Father, to be a light in the world and the salt of the earth. And Father, I ask these favors and blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your time.